Would you ever say, I'm going to buy a house at age 30? Or would you say my goal is to save enough money to be able to buy a house at age 30? The answer is probably the latter, right? It's great to set a goal based on a specific age, mostly because it gives you a timeline and then something to work towards. But you're not just gonna hit those goals on time if you don't actually take the steps that you need to take between now and then. It's not just a given that it's going to happen because you say it's going to. So why don't we treat retirement the same way? When it comes to that, we seem to think that retirement's something that we're all entitled to. And whether we should be or not, it's not the way that our world and our money systems are set up. But we're all fed the classic, go to school, get a job, work for a long time, and then you'll eventually you'll retire and you'll get to kick back and relax when you're older. It's kind of like we're all fed the idea that life's about working really hard. And if you work really hard for a long time, then you deserve a break. It's really the whole carrot and stick analogy in real life. When really, life's about making money. Not just for you to spend now, but for also for you to spend in the future. And people learn this eventually, because at some point they're gonna realize, oh, I can't actually just retire when I thought I was going to because I don't have enough money saved up. And having that realization then would definitely be learning it the hard way, because ideally you're finding that out earlier on when you still have the major benefit of time on your hands. But the problem with that is a lot of young people don't wanna talk about retirement, either because they think it's unnecessary or maybe they think it's scary, or they think it's just something that's so far away that they don't even wanna consider it yet. Instead, they wanna have fun and think about all that stuff later on, especially when we could potentially die tomorrow and not even make it to retirement anyways. Now, back when Social Security and pension plans were signed into law in both Canada and the US, the retirement age was actually closer to each country's respective life expectancy. So what that means is that a lot of people did actually die before retirement. But the numbers have actually kind of dramatically changed over the last several decades. Now, people are living longer, and even though you could die at any time, statistically speaking, you will make it to age 65. And then once you get there, the odds of you living even longer than 65 go up even more. There's actually a lot of information about this, but to keep it simple, here's a chart that shows the likelihood of you making it to a certain age based on your current age. So let's use me for an example, right? So the chart for people in their 20s shows an over 80% chance of making it to age 70 plus. Of of course, you can take your own identifiers and health history into account, and also where you live plays a huge impact as well. But once again, for the vast majority of people, and we are keeping it really, really simple here, the odds that you'll make it to retirement heavily outweigh the odds that you won't. Now, just because you'll live long enough to see the typical retirement age, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't also have balance and enjoy your life. But what it does mean is that you shouldn't be enjoying your life at the complete expense of the life that you probably will have a few decades from now. So that actually kind of debunks the idea that you shouldn't have to worry about retiring in case you do die young. Now, everything I just said is still kind of acting like retirement is an age. I think I literally said retirement age, so implying age 65. But again, retirement isn't an age at all. It's an amount of money. Here's how our world really works. Everything costs money, from being able to have a roof over our head, to eating food, to transportation to get us from one place to another, to anything fun that's beyond basic necessities that we need to survive. And we all know that. Like, I'm definitely not telling you anything new by mentioning that. But what we sometimes don't think about is how what we do to make money connects to us spending money on all those different things. When we're taught that classic sequence of school, work hard, good job, what we're really being told is to make a lot of money. And even in any path you take, even if it doesn't include school, like if you're doing a trade or you're becoming an entrepreneur, the goal is to maximize how much money you bring in. And a lot of the time we think that the point of making more money is to live a better lifestyle. Like, oh, a salary increase, great, that means I can get a better place to live. Or a bonus, perfect, that means I can get a better car or I can take more vacations. Now, sometimes into a certain point, it can make sense to upgrade your life and enjoy some of that money. But if you blindly think that more money equals a better life for you right now, then you're missing one big part. That big part is the fact that since we need money for everything that we do from the essentials to the fun stuff and we work in order to make money and spend on those things when we decide that we want to stop working altogether we won't have any more money coming in from our income or from working so then how do we pay for stuff well, with the money that you saved when you were younger. So if you understand that you're likely going to live into your 60s, 70s, and likely beyond that too, and you also understand that you probably don't wanna be working all the way up until you cease to exist anymore, then the big part in between those two ideas is the fact that you'll need a pool of money for you to spend during those years. Now, the ideal money life cycle for the average person making a livable income, because we're gonna talk in a second about the people who can't actually afford to do this at all, it would look like this. You get a job that can at least cover your essential things that you need to buy. Then you get a salary increase and maybe you improve the way that you're living life a little bit. Then when you get another salary increase, now you start putting some of that extra money away for retirement. 
Then when you get another salary increase, now you start to use your best judgment to decide how you should upgrade your life now. Maybe you send some money on that. Maybe you hit a new life stage where you're buying a home or you have a family that you wanna spend some money on. And then you also spend a little bit of that money to upgrade the future post-working life as well. And then the cycle continues on like that. And that's exactly how I like to look at it. You're upgrading your life now versus upgrading your life in the future. And the good news is that you do have the ability to do both. If you're someone who's able to follow that general cycle that Steph just showed, then you're in a great position to have a good life and retire at an age that you actually plan for, especially if you save for retirement in a smart way. But let's put a pin in that for a second. For a lot of people, their incomes won't be high enough to save for retirement. And it's a problem because we have a lot of jobs that are essential to the way our world and our economies work, but the minimum wage threshold often isn't an amount of money that's actually gonna allow these people to save for the future. A lot of these people are just stuck, just completely thinking about surviving the now. This ties into one of our favorite lines, which is that anyone can make it, but not everyone can. This means that even if someone does manage to break out of that position and all of a sudden they're earning more money and they're improving their financial life, not everyone in that position can do the same thing. We literally need those jobs no matter what. So someone's gonna have to fill that slot. So if you are someone who's able to save for retirement and you're not doing that, you're doing yourself a huge disservice by not taking advantage. Now, after the battle of realizing that you do need to save for retirement and why, and once again, the why part I think is really, really important because if you're someone who's just blindly saving for retirement and you don't understand the importance or the fact that you're doing this for you and that it benefits you, then you probably won't hit those numbers that you wanna hit. But anyways, after that, what you need to know is how to do it and how much you'll need. There's actually a few different strategies out there for calculating how much you'll need, but one of them is called the Trinity Study. And it basically says that based on the history of the stock market and how it goes up and down, you can afford to take out 4% of your invested money per year to spend in retirement. So you work backwards from there. If you spend $40,000 a year now and you wanna spend that much in retirement, then you're gonna need 25 times that or a million dollars in order to retire. So whenever you hit that, then great, you can now retire. One thing that I will say though, is that if you are young, you probably won't know exactly how much you're gonna be wanting to spend in retirement, but what you can do is you can actually just stick with an estimate or a ballpark number and then just adjust it over time as things change. Really the key takeaway from even looking at this strategy is that it shows you that it's not about reaching an age, but it's about reaching a number. And the more you invest earlier on, the quicker you're gonna reach that number. And the less you invest, the longer it's gonna take. For me and Steph, we're taking the time while we're young to consistently invest as much money as we can in order to take advantage of time but we're also working on increasing our incomes as much as we possibly can in order to invest even more money. So we're not calculating an exact number yet. We're actually just trying to bring up our incomes and be as disciplined with our money as possible first, but then we'll be more specific with that golden number in the future. Okay, so now I wanna take the pin out of what Dennis mentioned before, which is saving for retirement in a smart way. And before he mentioned, I think a million dollars being saved for retirement, and keep in mind that was definitely just an example because a lot of people are gonna want an amount that's actually higher than that. But even if we just look at a million dollars, it's not like a lot of people can actually save $1 million in cash just sitting in a savings account. Instead, you'll need to invest your money so it can grow over time. And something that I think is really cool about investing is the fact that the earlier you start, the more that time does some of the work for you. Here's an example. Let's say we have two people, Dennis and Steph. Dennis starts investing at age 20 and he puts $250 per month into an S&P 500 index fund. In 40 years, he'll have only put in an amount of $120,000, but the total value would be around 1.4 million. Now let's say Steph does the exact same thing, but she doesn't start until age 30 and she invests more money, $500 per month. In her case, she would put in a total amount of $180,000 and have a total value of just over 1 million. That 10 year difference meant that Dennis got to save $60,000 less, but still ended up with a lot more money. Now remember that this is just an example again, and the 10% average annual return isn't promised, but the part that is promised is the time element. And we know that the earlier you start, the more likely you are to end up with more money and you'll have to actually save and contribute less yourself. And I think this example really shows also what a privilege it is to be able to start investing young. Now, if you're watching this, don't get too stressed about the whole 20 versus 30 age difference if you're actually older than that already. Just think about yourself starting to invest now versus 10 years later and that should help. If you're like me, then everything I just said, even if it sounds a little stressful and overwhelming at first, it's actually really exciting and empowering. Cause now you're not just blindly saving for retirement or thinking that life's this cycle of school, work, retire automatically and then die anymore. Like I know for me, when I learn all of these different things, it actually makes me feel like I have some control over my present and my future self. And that feels a lot better and it's a lot more of a confidence builder than just always feeling like you have no clue what's gonna happen for yourself. 
There's actually a lot of things that we could talk about when it comes to retirement. Like the fact that the average retirement age is actually rising and kind of like what we were talking about a bit earlier about how there's literally people out here who cannot afford to save for retirement. Like, like I mean like at all. So what we wanna tell you is that if you're in a position where you can save for retirement, then you should embrace it and take advantage of it instead of living a lifestyle that you likely won't be able to sustain. Overall, balance is key and life is meant to be enjoyed, but you have to know what you're balancing on the other side. If you wanna learn how to actually start investing like we mentioned, check out this video for a step-by-step -step breakdown. And like that, we'll see you soon. You guys know the vibes and let's go.